Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Marcela. I'm a doctor from Brazil. And today we have another special global VMR uh, with a focus on the IMG match. Uh, and today we have an amazing program presenting a case to us, the University of Maryland Midtown Campus Internal Medicine Program. Uh, so first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Chow. He's the program director. Uh, Dr. Chow, can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you like to do outside of medicine? Hi. Uh, uh, good day, everyone. I'm so uh, I'm, I'm so happy uh, uh, that we had the chance to present a case uh, to you all. We're very excited to do so. Uh, we're honored to be invited to uh, to participate. Um, we had such a great time last year. Um, this is such a wonderful platform, um, and uh, I, I, I enjoy it um, uh, on a daily basis. Um, so we're, we're located here in Baltimore, and I've been here for 35 years uh, practicing in Baltimore. And, uh, and you, will, you would too. If, once, if you come to Baltimore, uh, you will never leave. Uh, and the reason is because we have crab cakes. And you get addicted to the crab cakes. And uh, once you have a crab cake here in Baltimore, uh, you, it, there's there's no you, there's other places that say they make crab cakes. No, uh, it's you, no, it's not it's not it's not close. And uh, I, I've tried to leave Baltimore a few times, but you keep coming back, and it's because of the crabs and the crab cakes. Oh, that's amazing! I'm, I'm here for the raisins. Uh, I'm not allergic to crash. So. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Oh, and Dr. Park, uh, could you also please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you like to do outside of medicine? Oh, and in you finish, if you could please pass the mic to the other residents or other people here in, about in the program. Oh, uh, so introduce myself and uh, pass it off to the other residents of our program. Yeah, yeah. All right, Perfect. Thank you. All right. Uh, hi. Yeah. So my name is Shay. I'm uh, a third year internal medicine resident in the town. I'm originally from South Korea. I uh, came here 12 years ago. Uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So not as much crab cakes, but raisins still. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm applying to endocrinology. Uh, that's a subtle hint. But anyways, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I hope the match goes well. Anyways, uh, like uh, hurry, you're next. Hello, I'm PGY3 at the University of Maryland Midtown Campus. I'm also serving as a primary care chief resident. I'm interested in primary care as well. And then it was nice meeting. It's nice meeting you guys. And next is Sneha. Hey everyone, I'm Sneha Thomas, um, PGY3, one of the uh, patient safety chiefs currently, uh, interested in vascular medicine, originally from India, moved to Philadelphia, now in Baltimore. So nice to meet y'all. I see Siham also on the list here. Hello, good morning, everyone. Yeah, you want to introduce yourself, maybe? Uh, like uh, last time I checked, you're a, a second year resident, I think. Yes, I'm still a Can second you... year resident at Midtown. Yes, okay. Thank you for verifying that. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Uh, do we have anyone else from the program here? I, uh, I see Spiros as well. Spiros, you want to introduce yourself? Can you, can you turn on the turn on the volume more? How about that? Yeah. No? Okay, hi. Hello, I'm Spiridon. Uh, I'm a PGY2 resident as well. I'm interested in endocrinology, like Jay, and I come originally from Greece. Nice to meet everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think now we can start, right? Uh, so we have Dr. Park presenting a case to us, and then we are going to discuss the case. And in the end, we can open for questions about the program so we can uh, know more about this program. Thank you. So Dr. Park, the mic is yours. 
the whiteboard would be nice so that people can like a uh, yeah perfect all right so we have uh a case the chief complaint is uh the nausea vomiting So the, 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 the patient is a 28-year-old female with history of type 1 diabetes. Uh, she was actually initially like was referred to the clinic for pre-op evaluation uh, prior to uh, a gastric pacemaker placement for uh, refractory gastroparesis. And uh, she has had a uh, six month history of uh, uh, progressive and persistent nausea and vomiting. And uh, she was, uh, so she was, uh, and then she had to be uh, treated, uh, she had to go to the ED and was admitted because of the severe uh, nausea and vomiting symptoms. She was at a, uh, different hospital recently, yeah. so for three weeks. And then the hospital course was complicated by hypoglycemic seizures, uh, requiring GPN. And uh, the, the review system was positive for uh, lightheadedness, malaise, anorexia, diffuse body aches, constipation, depressed mood, and some uh, weight loss. She lost about 30 pounds over the one year, last one year. Okay, um, that's the first part. Yeah, okay, thank you so much, Dr. Park. So I see here that we have a patient with nausea and vomiting. Um, and as Drew uh, said in the chat, it's very tough considering the past medical history, right? Because it's a patient with type 1 diabetes, um, this gastric uh, replacement and gastroparesis. So is it related or not? So those are the first thoughts that came to my mind. Um, and also this hypoglycemic seizure is something he maybe her uh, type 1 diabetes is not so well controlled. She's having hypoglycemic episodes. Uh, how could it be related? Um, and also this weight loss, is it just because of the diabetes or maybe something else? Uh, maybe, for example, uh, malignancy that can also be related to uh, this diabetes or not? Um, and we have in the chat some, some questions about the diagnosis, maybe could be related to a syndrome like men one. Um, so I think those are my first thoughts. We can also uh, wait a little bit for the chat and I can pass the mic to Javi to help me. You know, I wish people pronounced my name the way you do. It sounds so much better when you say it than anybody else. Thank you, Marcella. Um, welcome to everybody. It's a delight to have you all here. I think we have you have re residents representing uh, countries of origin across the whole world, literally like east to west, which is so cool to see in your program. I also can't help but be biased that Jay told us he wants to be an endocrinologist and the first words out of his mouth were diet type 1 diabetes. So I, uh, it's hard not to anchor in that space. Um, but yeah, Marcella, I think, I think um, it's very interesting that this patient is coming in with just nausea and vomiting. And not to minimize the significance of nausea and vomiting, it's just to emphasize that she's at risk for so many things and yet her chief concerns are nausea and vomiting. And when you hear that she has gastroparesis, especially something that is so advanced and so refractory requiring um, a, a gastric pacemaker, then, um, uh, then it must be very severe. And I know, um, I know that she hasn't, yeah, 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 she hasn't had it yet. But, yeah. yeah, it's, uh, she hasn't, I, I, I don't know, it was misunderstood. So uh, she hasn't gotten the gastric pacemaker yet. She was initially yes. referred to us for evaluation. Yes. Yeah, so just, just yeah. want to 
No, thank you. That's a very, a very important clarification. And I think that it doesn't, it, the calculus from that perspective doesn't change too much in terms of whether she has it or not for us today. It rather just informs the fact that somebody or a group of people think it's so severe that that's even in the equation, right? right? And so the question is, is there any reason to doubt that as a diagnosis? And the answer is maybe, um, maybe because she's having so many other um, and, and issues not directly attributable to the gastroparesis. But you could easily say that this is a patient with, um, with a refractory type 1 diabetes of significant severity, causing autonomic dysfunction and causing um, weight loss and, um, and, and dehydration through hyperglycemia and lightheadedness. But there's, from the very beginning, a marked disconnect. And that disconnect is actually very subtle. Anyone care and uh, anyone care to, to outline what they might think would be things that are opposite of each other, subtly but important. I'll, I'll I guess I'll start. Um, probably the hyper, well, the hypoglycemic seizures in the context of her type one diabetes, but that could also be explained by the fact that she has, uh, you know that it is that her diabetes may be hard to control. I mean, I've seen it in much younger patients, uh, spe uh, specifically in the very, very, like very, very early childhood. Like if you diagnose type one diabetes in a two-year-old, for instance, where their glucose targets are actually set higher than um, you normally would because of the fact that if you give them a dose, if you give them even just a whiff of insulin, their sugars will just tank mm -hmm. um, and you, and you do not want to in, in diabetes, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia is bad in the long term. Hypoglycemia will kill you. Um, I did also want to say, and I put this in the chat. I also think that pancreatitis should be on the differential as well. I know that um, the main concern is nausea and vomiting, but these are also concerns that um, in addition to uh, epigastric pain um, that are decently common in type 1 diabetes. And in particular, um, just having some personal experience with dealing with this, um, there's a condition called um, called acquired lipodystrophy, where essentially if you have type 1 diabetes that's very hard to control, you can get to a point where you where the fat distribution is um, so altered that you essentially get a hypertriglyceridemic uh, uh, pancreatitis without necessarily having elevated uh, triglycerides in a patient with type 1 diabetes. And it can get bad enough where you have to put the patient in the ICU for, uh, for their pain control. Um, like I've seen patients who had to go uh, get into the ICU to get ketamine to, uh, to get pain control. So, cool. Thank you, Drew. I think Malak made the key point. This patient should be very concerned about the possibility of adrenal insufficiency. Let me tell you why. You have the combination of the fact that this patient has markers of poor diabetic control, which would be worsening gastroparesis and weight loss. And yet she's hypoglycemic instead of hyperglycemic. Think about that. Everything is saying that this patient has too little, uh, uh, has an insulin deficiency syndrome. What are the things that um, match up with insulin deficiency, relative insulin deficiency, gastroparesis, weight loss, but yet her sugars are low. That combination in a type 1 diabetic should have you think adrenal insufficiency until proven otherwise, especially in a patient who has an autoimmune diathesis. So I would say that while many things are possible and the differential remains extremely broad, I am very worried that this patient has occult adrenal insufficiency. And I wouldn't otherwise think about that in normal people on aliquot one, but it is so life-threatening that you have to think about it now. So I completely agree with everybody. We have to take nausea and vomiting at face value, entertain things like pancreatitis, even rare things like lipodystrophy and common things like gastroparesis. But when you're seeing things that are evocative for refractory type one diabetes, gastroparesis, weight loss, you expect hyperglycemia. And the fact that she's hypoglycemic 
should prompt you to think about adrenal insufficiency. Is it the most likely cause? No, it's driven in priority by its morbidity. In fact, it's lethality if it's untreated. All right, Jay, back to you. All right, thanks for the discussion. Uh, some of the questions that were in the chat can be explained because uh, we're going to go to the uh, past medical history section. So she had type 1 diabetes since age 16. And she also has a history of hypothyroidism since age 18. She's, uh, uh, those are the past medical history. The medications that she's on is a, um, so at home, she's on a synthroid 125 kilo. And a uh, insulin 7030. This is a bit of an older key. She's on 7030. Uh, and uh, she's on uh, 18 and uh, 12. Uh, morning and night. And then uh, in the hospital, she has received uh, Zofran, Reglan, uh, Pepsid. Her levothyroxine was changed to 75 IV. Hypothyroidism, not hypoparathyroidism. The home level, yes, uh, uh, one point five kilo. Okay. The insulin 7030 is uh, like a, please write that, that's actually the North Forsy. DID, 18 and 12. So uh, 18 units in the morning and 12 at night. Thank you. Uh, this was in the back in the day. This was a little back in the day. Yes. And uh, she also had some coverage issues. Correct. And uh, uh, family history. Okay. So uh, her mother has hypothyroid. Uh, that's it, and uh, uh, she has allergies to morphine. Uh, social history, uh, she's a housewife, lives with a husband, no children, uh, doesn't use marijuana, no uh, tobacco, alcohol, no other drug use, no uh, STD history. Does not. Does not use cannabis yet. Hives. Uh, she gets uh, hives from morphine. I think we usually stop before the physical exam, is that right? I think just for the sake of time, maybe you can give us the exam. We wanna make sure we have some time to get to know your program. All right, uh, vital signs, the uh, temperature uh, 36.8, uh, respiratory 12, uh, oxygen normal, uh, BMI of 15. Uh, and uh, she's, uh, uh, blood pressure is uh, 110 over 65. Orthostats weren't able to be obtained. Uh, she, she's a thin, cachectic, and lethargic looking. She has uh, dry oral mucosa. 
Oh, heart rate uh, 72. Uh, neck, uh, neck exam, no lymphopathy, neck supple, no thyroid enlargement. Uh, chest uh, uh, CKB, heart regular rate of rhythm. Uh, the abdomen, mild left upper quadrant, uh, right upper quadrant tenderness. Uh, bowel sounds are the four plus. No organic mechanism. No EDMA clubbing on extremities. New York exam is uh, good. No hyperdynamic bowel sounds. Thank you, Jay. Marcella, what do you think? Thank you, Javi. So I'm thinking right now that um, our, our hypothesis about the autoimmune disease or some syndrome, like we mentioned before, the men's syndromes, because she has hypothyroidism, so another possible autoimmune condition. Um, her mother had hypothyroidism, so it could be autoimmune related. Um, I can see also that in the physical exam, I am very worried because she's lethargic. She seems dehydrated. So maybe some something that I need to act first and then think about the diagnosis. Um, and yeah, those are my first thoughts. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I think that this and this this exam is very concerning because of how ill she is, but also her baseline BMI of 15. That is very, very concerning. Um, and I think that, um, um, yeah, I think that, you know, in this patient, you would probably be trying to hydrate her in, in anticipation of the labs. And I think that the question is, is there anything on exam that you can detect that may be subtle? And I think this is a patient, again, to emphasize them not missing the most morbid thing, where you want to look for very subtle signs of adrenal insufficiency. Marcella, do you know any off the top of your head, like clues on physical exam for adrenal insufficiency? Um, I know that we can, you can have skin, um, your skin getting uh, darker because of the, the pathway with the melatonin. So it can yeah. happen. Yeah, and that's the most classic one. And the reason that that can be overlooked is it usually occurs on pressure points. So the palms and, and inside the mouth where the teeth hit the mucosa. So you can easily overlook them. So I would definitely do a subtle exam for that. The other really interesting one is called auricular calcifications or calcifications of the ears, which usually happens in men. So much more commonly in men. So it's, you, you wouldn't be surprised to miss it here. But let's also remember that the hyperpigmentation is as a result of primary adrenal insufficiency. Patients can get autoimmune secondary adrenal insufficiency and lack the hyperpigmentation. So for me, what would I do differently is I would, in addition to the usual labs, I would measure a cortisol, no matter what the labs show. Ideally, you measure an AM cortisol for sure, but I think that uh, low cortisol in this situation, especially if undetectably low, would augment your concern first. So um, yeah, let's pay close attention to the exam, easily overlooked in somebody who's so sick, easily. When you imagine walking into a room, somebody's nauseous, vomiting, not feeling good. Are you really going to be like, oh, show me your palm. Like, it's okay if you didn't do it initially, but keep it on your radar um, later. All right, Jane, Mike to you. All right. Uh, as uh, our program director says, uh, I think we're like, uh, like the, uh, the discussion and the development of the differential diagnosis was so good. So maybe we don't even need that. I'm oh my gosh, yes, we do. We're internal medicine doctors. What do we do without labs? Our entire existence is labs. <laughs> All right, well, a good physical exam. <laughs> a good physical exam. Uh, uh, anyways, okay. All right. So, uh, labs. I'll start with the CBC. Y count is 2.1. This is fine. Uh, hemoglobin 8.2. Plate plate 99. Sodium 143, potassium 4.4, uh, bicarb 20, anion gap 10, creatinine 0 0.5, glucose 223, 
somebody gets 30. I'm sorry. Uh, magnesium up to uh, 0 0.7. Uh, iCal 1.5. Mild elevation in uh, all of the, the LFTs, mild, like, like we're talking uh, 70, 80. Diff is fine. Yes, uh, uh, magnesium uh, zero point seven. Yes, uh, how how terrible, how horrible. Uh, Utox was fine. Oh, there's an ABG actually. It's uh, ABG of seven point three. Uh, CO two fifty one, O two ninety, and bicarbonate twenty. Seven point three. Yep. Thank you. All right. EKG showing sinus tachycardia. Oh, FOSS is 3.3. Chest X-ray normal, abdomen uh, X-ray non-obstructive bowel pattern. These are the ED labs, by the, by the way, yeah. Uh, Marcella, we're in a tough corner here. We definitely needed the labs. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I totally agree because I was I was mainly, you know, like the classic adrenal insufficiency. I was thinking, oh, I want to take a look at the sodium, the um, potassium, but they are they are normal there, right? But I'm thinking now that she's probably dehydrated. Um, and here I can I can see that her glucose is high, so it's it makes me very worried. Um, besides that, I can see that she has some pancytopenia, so I'm trying to think why is that happening. So it's like an underlying condition that maybe is causing all the trouble to her. Uh, so like is it something in the medulla that is um, decreasing the production? or destroy, destroying the lines. Um, so those are my thoughts for now. And I think I still need to take a better look at those labs. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I think that having that initial framework for pancytopenia, increased destruction, reduced production, um, is very helpful. And in the world of reduced production, there's kind of two types. There's the uh, um, bone marrow failure, or there's infiltration of the bone marrow. And here, the infiltration of the bone marrow is a hypothesis that isn't robust because we haven't found anything that infiltrates. You know, we haven't found a cancer or infection. So for me, I'm stuck in the increased destruction or primary bone marrow failure. And the primary bone marrow failure in many patients is as a result of nutritional deficiencies, which this patient is at, as at, is at risk for given her um, gastroparesis. So thinking about B12 or folate, um, is really, really important. So like, I, I curie the possibility of B12 folate, but those possibilities are a little bit less likely in the absence of macrocytosis or a high MCV. And so the question is, is there another reason that the bone marrow is failing? And I would say that, yeah, um, the, the hormonal deficiencies required to, um, to input the bone marrow, you would think that um, you think that EPO deficiency alone is, uh, is not enough to do, pan, to do pancytopenia, and that's correct. There are many cases of what's called panhypopituitarism, or the pituitary being the cause for pancytopenia. We had a case in, uh, in VMR a year or two ago from Andresa who had a Sheehan syndrome causing uh, pancytopenia. So when you're thinking about bone marrow failure, think about it as infiltration or primary bone marrow dysfunction. And here, the nutritional aspect is possible given the gastroparesis. The hormonal aspect is possible as hypopituitary in the context of her many autoimmune diseases um, and her hypothyroidism. And then the question is, are there any causes of increased destruction? And those come in three varieties. Infections, which are tick-borne diseases, not happening here. Cancers that cause autoimmune cytopenias, like CLL, not happening here. And then autoimmune disease. Could she have lupus? It's very possible. A little bit less likely in the absence of rash and the absence of renal failure, but definitely something you should think about in pancytopenia. For me, if, I, if you had to ask me what else helps you play around with these hypotheses, it's actually her sodium. Her sodium is 143. If you correct it, it's abnormal. Correct it for the hyperglycemia. Why is a young other why is a young otherwise healthy person 
not able to uh, drink enough water to maintain eunatremia. It's a little weird. So is that a point for the pituitary? Is that a point for us to invoke um, central diabetes insipidus potentially? So um, what would I do in real life? I would send off the, the markers for nutritional deficiency and evaluate the pituitary and maybe evaluate for the possibility of autoimmune disease with an ANA. But most importantly is what you said, Marcella. I think we need a peripheral smear to understand the CBC a little bit better. All right, Jay, Mike, to you. Uh, peripheral smear was uh, a fine, one plus schistocyte. By the way, MCV was at 80, FYI. Um, and uh, after admission, they had to do some more uh, labs. So the, uh, the, the autoimmune and endocrine labs as you suggested. So uh, TSH of 0 0.35, free T4 of uh, 2.1, Morning cortisol of 0 0.4, ACTH of uh, 258, 258, LH, FSH, prolactin normal, ANA 1280, TPO antibody 542, A1C 7.0, uh, CRP uh, 2.1. Okay. And then uh, they did a stem test. As somebody mentioned, highly suspected. Does, does she need a stim test? She does not need a stim test because like her AM quarters are less than three. So you really don't need it, but they did it regardless. So at time zero, cortisol undetectable. 30 minutes, 0 0.4, 60 minutes, 0 0.4. She does have transatomitis, yes, so, okay. That's all for that. Thank you, Jay. Can I just ask a, one clarifying question? Um, is the ACTH high? I don't know the normal. 258. Yeah, that's that's rather high. A normal range is between 5 to 27. Understood. 0 and, and what about the TSH and free T4? Are they both low? Uh, TSH is 0 0.3, which is slightly lower than normal, and free T4 is 2.1. And is that normal, the free T4? That's slightly high. But please recall that she is on the plate. Okay, perfect. All righty, Marcella, take it away, my friend. Oh, I'm still a little lost in the exams here. So let me see if I understood. The CTH is high, right? And the curve so low. So I'm thinking that probably she has a problem like we were suspecting, the adrenal glands. That's why the CTH is getting high, trying to make it function. Um, the smear looks like it's fine. It has cytocytes. It could mean that we are having some sharing in the red blood cells, but uh, I think it could also be just a finding and nothing that worries us now. Um, and let me see what else. Yeah, I, I think those are my first thoughts for now, and I need to pay more attention to the other labs. <laughs> I don't know if you need to pay attention to the other labs because those are the, exactly the dominant labs, honestly. I think when you see a morning cortisol of und basically undetectable um, of 0.4, you've diagnosed adrenal insufficiency. And the stem, cell, the stem test is not necessary, but helps you confirm that diagnosis because one test to make such a lifelong diagnosis is always a little bit tricky. Uh, and the stem test can help you confirm the diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency when you watch the cortisol not appropriately re respond to ACTH stimulation. It also helps you make guesses while the ACTH level is pending, which it usually takes time in our lab. If somebody uh, has, a, uh, has adrenal insufficiency, meaning their cortisol didn't respond enough, but still, uh, but um, you can still study the delta between the cortisol. If the cortisol doesn't move at all, if it doesn't move at all, that tells you that the adrenal gland is completely shut down and further supports the diagnosis of primary adrenal insufficiency. If the cortisol moves a little bit, but doesn't quite reach the levels uh, to exclude adrenal insufficiency, that is a little bit of a clue that you have secondary or tertiary adrenal insufficiency because in secondary and tertiary, the adrenal gland is fine. It just doesn't have enough ACTH. And when you give ACTH, the adrenal gland responds a little bit. It responds suboptimally. So here you diagnose the, the uh, adrenal insufficiency because the cortisol is very low. 
you then do a stim test and you see absolutely no response to ACTH, which tells you that the problem is in the adrenal gland. And then, um, uh, and then you see that the ACTH is high with further supports the diagnosis that there's an adrenal gland problem. Now the diagnosis, the cause of that stops in the, in the United States because it's autoimmune adrenalitis. In many parts of the world, including your own, you have to think, could this be tuberculosis or paracoxy, um, which have uh, been presented on VMR? And, and I think now you can say this person definitely has primary adrenal insufficiency. And now the question is, what do we do about those cytopenias? So in, in the, any thoughts about why they might have happened or what thoughts do you have about the cytopenias? Um, I'm sorry, I'm still trying to connect them, but I know that because she has low cortisol, it's going yeah. to affect the production of leukocytes. So I guess maybe for uh, the other cells too. I'm just not sure because 8.2, it's kind of like low to me. I'm not sure if that such a low cortisol could be causing that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. Um, I think it's tricky. I think if you just start to say, okay, she's got so many autoimmune diseases, could she have an autoimmune disease explaining her pancytopenia? And the first reflex might, might be to think of lupus, but another one is to think, could she have pernicious anemia? And is pernicious anemia causing B12 deficiency causing this pancytopenia? And the clue might be not just her risk profile, but the schistocyte that you see, because schistocytes can also be a marker of ineffective erythropoiesis, um, which can signal you to either MDS or B12 deficiency. So I would check a B12 in this patient, and I would also check to see if she has anti-intrinsic factor and anti-parietal cell antibody. I think the biggest takeaway in this case is look at look at look at this case and tell me it has adrenal insufficiency. If you look at the heart rate, normal, blood pressure, normal, sodium, normal, potassium, normal, and yet she has adrenal insufficiency, right? She has no laboratory findings suggestive of adrenal insufficiency, yet she has it. Why? The body protects you from developing those lab, laboratory abnormalities by having vomiting. So you eliminate the potassium, you uh, remove the water, so you protect from hyponatremia. So you have to be very careful with adrenal insufficiency. Anyone at risk for the condition should be tested for it because the labs, as this case proves, are not reliable enough. So be very careful. As soon as you think adrenal insufficiency, you should test. Don't lean on the labs because if Jay had just presented the labs, why would you think adrenal insufficiency? Sodium is normal, potassium is normal. A bicarb is a little low. Maybe that's a clue. Glucose is normal. Oh my gosh, you know? So humbled by uh, this very complex case, Jay, and I'm curious if the pancytopenia is another thread or if it just vanishes with um, adrenal uh, treatment. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the, the follow-up after uh, discharge on this patient. And the vitamin B12 was actually the first thing I, I actually would have tested also on top of this, but that I don't have information of that, nor uh, the anti-intrinsic factor, as you, uh, as you mentioned. I think in the chat, somebody mentioned like something close to a unified diagnosis, but uh, uh, like, uh, so anything that uh, comes to mind for the uh, discussions regarding a unified diagnosis. Any thoughts, Marcella? Yeah, no, I think I'm I'm still trying to understand everything, what could be unifying everything. I totally agree with the B12 and also because her BMI is 15. So I'm worried that she can also have other nutritional deficiency that could be causing that. Yeah, you know, I, I don't have any unifying diagnosis that explains the pancytopenia. I think it's important to try to explain that in real life. And the question for us is, for you and I, Marcella, is to wonder, what, what do you know of, what, uh, what conditions do you know of when patients have multiple endocrine issues? What crosses your mind when you just say, in general, I have a patient with many endocrinopathies, what crosses your mind? Yeah, I think about those men syndromes, men yep. one, men two, and um, so those are my first thoughts and also all immune conditions in general that can cause, yeah. affects a lot of different glands in the body. 100%. That's exactly right. That's a very simple way of doing it. The third thing that I would add is the pituitary. So when patients have a pituitary issue, they can have multiple endocrinopathies. 
And because we're here on CP solvers VMR, I'll throw another one, which is poem syndrome. That can also have another multiple endocrinopathy. The cool thing about uh, MEN, Marcella, is MEN causes endocrine excess syndromes. Too much, too much PTH, too much pituitary. Uh, deficiencies um, don't usually happen with MEN. So I think your second hypothesis is the correct one. It's the one that I would pursue, which is uh, a diagnosis of autoimmune polyglandular syndrome. That comes in three wonderful uh, flavors. Chocolate, I'm kidding, no. Type one, type two, and type three. Type one is associated with immunodeficiency and usually presents in childhood and has mucocutaneous candidiasis, so candida in the mouth, it's required. Type three is called IPEX syndrome and comes with really bad diarrhea and gastrointestinal issues. I think she has type two. You can't quite prove it because it is a genetically heterogeneous disease with many genetic foci involved. But the reason to, to suspect it is for family members. So we already heard her mother has it. So why do you care? You care because she's at risk of other endocrine issues, including maybe vitiligo, which is why we don't see hyperpigmentation, uh, but also mostly for her family. So your schema is superb. When you, when you see multiple endocrine issues, MEN1, autoimmune polyglandular syndrome are the genetic ones. The two acquired ones are poems and pituitary lesions. MEN is usually endocrine excess. Um, autoimmune polyglandular is endocrine deficiency. I knew it had to be endocrine, right? It had to be. Right. And uh, so there's a few comments in the chat as well. So it, yes, APS2. Correct. Uh, Schmidt syndrome is uh, like a subtype, the older definition of Schmidt syndrome is uh, hypothyroid plus uh, uh, the adrenal insufficiency. And Carpenter syndrome is uh, uh, hypothyroid plus type 1 diabetes. She has all three. Plus, yes, and uh, she has a, a problem. She might have gastritis, as you mentioned. So B12 testing would have been very beneficial and uh, potentially a test flow, but maybe like a uh, scope, but that, that would have been beneficial. It wasn't done. Also often associated with the eosinophilia and also the autoimmune hepatitis as uh, the, uh, the chat suggested. And uh, as uh, the Dr. J uh, mentioned, it's, uh, it's a HLA uh, type. So, APS1 is, uh, as you mentioned, it's uh, mainly, uh, it's a, a deficiency in the AIRE gene. So that's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's homogenic, but the, uh, the APS2 is a um, HLA-based uh, 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 immunodeficiency, essentially. So it's more heterogeneous. Uh, it's uh, often, very often seen in families. Uh, but uh, there's no clear guidelines as far as I know in terms of like we, if she, we should actually screen for certain people or not, but that, I don't think that's clear. Uh, but it is, uh, it is rather common. The overall instance is about uh, 1 to 2,000 or to 1 to 10,000. So that's rather common. So if you see a person, especially with type 1 diabetes and on, like on thyroid supplementation for Hashimoto's, and uh, if the patient is nausea vomiting, you should probably like th that sh all should almost be your next thought. In fact, absolutely amazing case. Thank you so much for humbling us with such a um, such a marvelous case. I have to tell you that I'm very biased um, in in just how much I think. Um, our CP solvers team members are incredible. And I think it's, you know, you know how nerve wracking it must be to be an applicant this year and to discuss a case out loud in front of 36 people and to do so with so much calmness, humility, and so much clinical excellence is unreal. And a massive shout out to you, Marcella, for being brave enough to do so. And an even bigger shout out to, um, um, to your uh, per wonderful persona that you showed here today. Thank you. I, I can't um, not acknowledge also the fact that Deborah is describing and doing so when her um, now fiance is visiting her for one weekend. She's still here scribing, which to me is a little crazy, but so endearing. And Shema, thank you for uh, also being above and beyond and for Rafa to be the master orchestrator behind it all.
Um, Jay, this is a really educational case. And I think it really, really highlights not just how, um, how deep and broad the patients that you all take care of, but in the way that you presented it and with the knowledge that you presented it, just how um, thoughtful and meticulous um, the providers and the clinicians that take care of your patients are. So thank you. This is a, a treat for me. And I'm curious, I will be silent from here on out. Curious what Marcella has to say. Oh, thank you so much, Javi. <laughs> oh, it was a wonderful experience. And thank you, Dr. Park and Dr. Chow for being here and presenting such an amazing case. I learned it so much. Uh, it was very challenging for me. And yeah, it was amazing. I learned so many uh, important things here. Uh, so now I would like to open to the audience. Um, please put your chat, your question in the chat. Um, and we will have the program uh, answering the question. Uh, and I think I I can go first and ask, ask Dr. Park, uh, what, what is your favorite thing about your program? Uh, are you asking me? Yes. First of all, I mean, there's not like one favorite thing, but one is the... Uh, I think we have unparalleled collegiality, and uh, we are absolutely uh, like not. In the, we are beyond like what people call a team or a family. We are really we are always standing for each other, so that we can get this our uh, tight knit network uh, succeed as much as possible and uh, make everything run as best as uh, possible. The other thing is the, uh, the probably the unparalleled amount of autonomy you get. You have in the supervision, and uh, so a lot of the pro, so a lot of the stuff, especially all of the stuff, especially is in fact pretty much uh, like staffed by uh, University of Maryland physicians. But at the same time, when it comes to your the primary care clinic. And also on the, the internal medicine, uh, it's just the regular floor and the IMG uh, rounds. You, 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 a lot of your, the, so much of the decision making and daily work falls on your shoulders, and it's uh, it's up to you. It's truly up to you. The and uh, uh, lastly, uh, we have a great track record of uh, sending uh, residents to wherever they want to go to. We have a great record. Uh, if you look at our website, our fellowship match is actually uh, actually quite amazing for a small uh, for a small program like us. And uh, so, and a, a recommendation from our faculty is something that you like uh, something to uh, die for, really. So uh, those uh, those are the things that come to mind. Uh, Hari or Sneha, can, can you uh, uh, can you know, add anything else that that comes to your mind? My favorite thing about this program is our program director, Dr. Chow. <laughs> he has been very, very uh, supportive. And as you can see, I know he's a very busy person, but he attends this meeting. And then whenever there is an event, he always try to present the meeting to help the residents. Because we are a small program, Dr. Chow knows every resident and he tries to do his best to help our residents to do what they want after graduation. And I always tell my husband that, oh, Dr. Chow must be the best program director in the U.S. So I'm very happy with this program. <laughs> it's very, very supportive. By a letter from a faculty, I mentioned it, like I was alluding to Dr. Chow's, by the way. Yeah, I, I agree with what Jay and uh, Harim said. I mean, it may seem like Dr. Chow, you know, may have paid us to say this, but, you know, he didn't. But um, uh, I, I think at the end of the day, um, like, you know, no matter where you go, like, like intern year residency is a challenging period of time. And I think it really matters that you go to a program where the program really looks out um, for you as a person, not just as a person doing work for the hospital. You know, I feel like that's where uh, our program, like, you know, it's kind of weird saying, talking about this while Dr. Chow is here, but, you know, um, you know, our program coordinator, um, Shira, Ms. Wanda, Dr. Chow, like everybody really um, um, know what you want to do, like in life, in, you know, in academics, in personal life, you know, 
um, all the details about you, including like your personal allergies to food when they, you know, buy you lunch, for example, you know, so they go really out of their way to kind of ensure that you get the best education, you get the best opportunities, um, and you achieve whatever it is that your um, dream is. And I feel like even for candidates, I feel like Dr. Chow always says, this, you know, I've seen him say this to many people, like, well, maybe this, if this is what you want to do, maybe this is not a for program for you. I feel like many program directors won't say that because they feel like, oh, you should come here. You know, you may be a great candidate for us, but we may not be a great program for you. And I feel like not many people can say that. So, yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. We we can see how much uh, that's a great program by looking at your face, talking about your own program and how proud are you. So that that's wonderful. Um, so I, I have a question here. Uh, Dr. Chow, uh, what do you look for in an applicant? Hey, so first of all, um, uh, I deny any anything that they all said. Uh, but uh, I I thought this was totally amazing because the, the the workup of this case it took uh, days days you know it takes uh, multiple days and you all nailed the diagnosis in twenty minutes uh, I, I'm I'm totally uh, amazed by that and I I was thinking if we had the clinic pro clinical problem solvers with us every day in our pocket the length of stay in our hospital would be measured in in minutes not days. You guys, this is a what, what an amazing resource. Uh, well, anyway, uh, 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 Marcella, you, you, what did you you ask me a uh, what, I, what what was I supposed to comment on? I'm just so, my I'm, I'm so amazed. I forgot exactly what, what what I was supposed to say. Oh, no problem, Dr. Chow. I, I feel the same about the clinical problem solvers. It's <laughs> just like changed my life so much. Um, <laughs> I, the question was, what do you look for in uh, oh. in an applicant for your program? Oh, 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 okay. So, you know, I, um, I, I think that, you know, I, I get asked this question a lot. I think the most important uh, uh, quality uh, is uh, humility. I think a, 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 uh, a learner who's humble will want to get better. A learner who is humble uh, will look for ways to improve. We'll look for resources to help them improve. We'll be, we'll be passionate about, about wanting to be better, about wanting to improve uh, on a performance that, that, that's already at a high level. I, I, and I think that's um, what we would like to, because uh, I think um, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard for us uh, as faculty to identify uh, how to help um, uh, residents as they move along uh, in, in the path in, in, the, in their training. Um, but um, having uh, some, having passion and having humility, it's a great combination. Uh, and uh, for, for the most part, I feel like we as faculty sit on the sidelines and we just cheer our residents on. Uh, we're more uh, spectators than we are on the field. Yeah, thank you so much for that amazing reply. Um, I think that, does anyone else have a question? Please put it in the chat. Um, and maybe just to finish, uh, in the beginning you mentioned about the crab legs. Uh, what other things you would recommend us to, to look for when we are in Baltimore? Places to visit or things to eat? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, you know Baltimore has, is a nice, uh, um, uh, it's a diverse uh, community. Uh, we are um, we serve a uh, underserved community here in in the downtown area, um, uh, but it's a diverse community. There's uh, d diverse uh, cultures uh, here, um, and it's something that we 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 celebrate. Um, I don't know. Uh, the, the, you know, you, there was a there was a time when the, someone asked what career paths do residents take and. Um, uh, every year is different. Uh, the, we have uh, several people in the program uh, who are interested in. Uh, so uh, uh, it seems like a lot of people want to go on to pursue subspecialty fellowship. Uh, that's not by our. We don't try to emphasize that or encourage that. 
uh, we try to uh, have each person define what their passion is, and then we help them mature that passion, mature that interest, and um, and and I, and I, at the end, we hope that they are uh, uh, successful. And but these are goals um, and paths that we want them to define. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so I think we still have some questions in the chat, uh, but to respect our time, uh, we would like to thank our guests and maybe um, we have probably the website, they can look for more questions, right, Dr. Chow? Okay, so thank you so much uh, for being here. It was an amazing session. Thank you so much, Dr. Chow and all the residents. We had a wonderful time and amazing discussion. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks to Jay. Thanks, everyone.